Welcome back to the Pilgrim Faith Podcast, where human wonder fuels the quest for Christian wisdom. Today, my co-host Dale and I are joined by Dr. Crawford Gribben, who is uh, teaches history at Queen's University Belfast, a uh, description that you'll find plausible uh, in just a moment. Uh, we are here to talk to him about his very fascinating book just uh, published with Oxford University Press, Survival and Resistance in Evangelical America, Christian Reconstruction in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, maybe the first thing to just say out of the gate, uh, uh, Dr. Gribben, uh, well, first, I suppose the thing to say is thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. We're very yeah. happy to have you. <laughs> yes. Lo lovely to be here. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, one thing that Dale and I were talking about before we started recording is that the book was surprisingly personal for both of us. I was uh, mm -hmm. I was raised in the Dallas area in the 90s and was part of kind of that, uh, you described this in the book, the kind of wave of homeschooling that happened in the 90s. And so a lot of the figures in the book were sort of household names. Uh, uh, and it was helpful to sort of see that, that those, those, those cultural winds, as it were, uh, placed in a, in a larger narrative context. So there's a lot to talk about there. Maybe, but maybe for our audience, the, the 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 basic sort of logically prior question to anything else is, for those who don't know what what Christian Reconstructionism is, uh, uh, you know, it, it, in the media these days, people are talking about dominionism, you know, with the Trump election and such. This phrase is being thrown about, in, you know, sort of sloppily in journalistic contexts. Yeah. Uh, but what's a uh, uh, what's a, a way for the uninitiated, perhaps, to get their mind around whatever this reconstruction thing is? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Well, I mean, if you pay attention to a lot of popular media, as you mentioned there, that the word dominion crops up a lot, and especially with reference to the religious right uh, in the United States, often linked to ideas of Christian nationalism, sometimes linked to ideas of, of white nationalism. It's often given a racial complexion. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's often described or, or it's often used or deployed to evoke some kind of strategic power play on the part of major politicians who are cogs in some vast right wing network, uh, which is planning variously to um, a, a, a attempt to coup, uh, subvert the Constitution and um, bring into reality the, the, the world of The Handmaid's Tale, Margaret Atwood's novel. You know, so the, 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 you know, the, the whole concept of dominionism is an incredibly lazy journalistic effort to describe a multiple uh, and often completely disconnected, sometimes competing sequence of communities or agendas, which for various rhetorical reasons, it suits them to lump together and to, to, to give this you know, pretty scary title to. Of course, it's also the case that there are actual dominionists mm -hmm. out there, uh, and, and some of them are, in fact, um, uh, right-wing politicians with vast influence. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and some of them you know, have been pretty close to getting the Republican ticket, uh, presidential ticket, in the last number of years. Um, that, that kind of dominionism, for all that it is... Um, politically popular in certain sections of the right uh, isn't really to be linked to what we're talking about today, which is Christian Reconstruction. They're often lumped together, but actually they're quite different. Um, they may have a similar kind of objective, which is to see America brought under some kind of um, hegemonic Christian influence, but the routes by which that vision will be achieved are quite different. So for the Ted Cruz Dominionists, the project is to seize uh, the institutions of power, and then to roll out uh, this vast political uh, agenda, um, legal, uh, cultural agenda. For Christian Reconstructionists, however, the, the effort is quite different. Although they may still wish for and expect to see uh, a great revival of Christian influence nationally, and a revival that would undoubtedly have implications politically, culturally, legally, and so forth, the route by which that will be achieved is not through top-down imposition of power, but through bottom-up um, growth um, over generations. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's not, it's not, they're not looking for a revolution. Um, as you know, you know, the, the word revolution, of course, often is linked with dominionism, whether it's the Trump revolution or, or something else. But but instead of looking for top-down dramatic change 
Christian Reconstructionists look for organic, slow, but certain growth in Christian influence taking place over generations. So I think that, that, that in a nutshell is the difference between the two, Joe. Uh, Christian Reconstruction obviously uh, is, a, is quite a philosophical movement. It's a movement that's produced quite a considerable literature from the 1960s really to the present day, um, although it has changed significantly through that period. And uh, I think you can also see generations within the intellectual history of, of Reconstruction. Um, and that's maybe something that we might want to talk about later on. So the, I, I say that because Reconstruction is something that has evolved and it's got its, got its own history. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, and, well, go ahead Go ahead and maybe, I think that's a, it's worth uh, uh, maybe uh, outlining that just briefly. If you were to sort of, uh, if you were to sort of slice it up into convenient boxes, how would you how would you slice it up? Yeah, okay, so let's slice and dice it. So if we're going to slice and dice it, we'd probably want to have uh, the Rashtuni version of Reconstruction as, as our first major node in this network. So uh, R.J. Rashtuni was an Armenian-American Presbyterian minister uh, who had a, a, a quite considerable um, influence in California. Um, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, 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 he was, in many respects, a very unusual man. I think that's, that's fair to say. He held a raft of extremely controversial opinions. Um, in some of his published work, he, he makes gestures towards Holocaust denial. Um, there's undoubtedly a, a kind of racial component to some of his discussion as well, although apparently in reality, um, it, you know, in, in his own pastoral ministry, that that wasn't really reflected. But so, so he's he's an individual with some, you know, some very difficult and 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 uh, problematic um, ideas. Also, some quite eccentric ideas uh, in terms of the history of Presbyterianism. He believed, for example, that the Old Testament dietary laws were to continue to the present day. He also mm. published in favour of what's known as geostationary theory, the idea that the Earth is at the centre of the solar system and everything else. Mm. Uh, orbits around the earth so you know he had some um deeply problematic ideas he had some other extremely eccentric ideas but his his main his main concept his main agenda was to look to the bible to provide a blueprint for social theory mm. now in the 60s and 70s of course there was that you know the, the jesus people revival uh, there was a mm. lot of things going on uh, in, in, in california in the west coast and and christian reconstruction um, finds perhaps a rather unexpected context uh, in the Jesus People revival, but <laughs> but, we, but we, we find some of the earliest evidences of Rashtuni's influence in his partnership, for example, with Hal Lindsay, uh, mm -hmm. author of the Luke Great Planet Earth. Hal Lindsay ran a, a kind of Christian student house called the Jesus Christ Light and Power Company, uh, just close to the UCLA campus, and Rashtuni was one of the speakers who would come along to that and talk to the students. And, you know, if you know anything about Hal Lindsey um, and the late great planet Earth, which was the New York Times best-selling non-fiction work of the 1970s, it sold upwards of 20 million copies. It's all about doom, gloom, and very bad wordplay. However, <laughs> in, in he's got a completely different version of, of, of um, Christian expectation and, uh, and, 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 and what it is that, that Christians ought to be doing. One of the first things that Rushduni did um, that, that was significant in terms of developing Reconstruction was to move very emphatically towards a post-millennial worldview. So while Hal Lindsay was saying um, everything's going to get worse very fast and there's no point, as he put it, polishing the brass in the sinking ship, Rashtuni took exactly the opposite view and saw that the scriptures demonstrated he believed that Christian influence would grow and grow and grow and that the world would essentially be Christianized before and not after the return of Christ. So that being the case, he, he, he then you know, made the, the obvious uh, connections then to, 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 to realize that if the world was going to be Christianized, if the United States was going to become a majority Christian country, Christians had to put their thinking caps on and ask themselves, well, what kinds of social theory are going to influence the world that Christians are going to make? Um, what's it going to look like when the majority population of voters in the US electoral system are confessing Christians? Who will they vote for? 
what kinds of candidates will they be and what kinds of policies will they want to advance? Uh, and Rushdini argued then, well, you know, the, 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 the view of Hal Lindsay, uh, the dispensational view, the kind of pop dispensational view that Hal Lindsay was promoting, which radically divorced Old and New Testaments, had really nothing to offer Christians who were expecting um, the, the, the world to be essentially Christianized before the return of Christ. Because the New Testament didn't give, didn't provide the kind of social theory that, for example, the Mosaic Covenant did. Mm -hmm. And so um, Rushdie then made, I think, the logical move, which was to look back to uh, the Mosaic Covenant and to ask himself the question, well, if Christians are going to be the majority population, if they're going to be guided in a, in, in a, in a, a real way by the demands of Old Testament ethics, the ethical system of the Mosaic Covenant, then what does the, what does the Mosaic law, what does the Ten Commandments, what, what does the case law, the judicial law that Christians had for centuries overlooked by this point, what does the, 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 the judicial law say about what law should do what law should be based upon, which sins should be crimes, uh, how should those crimes, sins which are crimes, be punished? And, you know, he then began to write, uh, for example, Institutes of Biblical Law, a thousand-page book, Exposition of the Ten Commandments, and, you know, you've got everything in there from um, leveret marriage to the gold standard, you know, and, you know, there's, there's everything in there from how to organise a family, to, 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 you know, how to think about a national economic system. And, uh, and you know, that, that's really what, what Rushdoon is all about. And he, he unpacks that, he rolls that out over, gener over a generation, over decades, uh, and moves uh, in California to, to create a little community around himself. He was quite a patriarchal figure uh, to, to create a community around himself. And these ideas were, were really believed. Um, and, uh, and, and that, continued. Uh, he set up a think tank called the Chalcedon Institute. He began initially to circulate kind of homemade um, um, books, you know, lecture tapes uh, and so on. He did a, a huge amount of work in guaranteeing rights to home education in mm. several of the states where there were important test cases that, that were going to ascertain whether it had constitutional status or not. So he, he, he played a huge role in the legalization or, or, or the ratification of rights for homeschooling across the, the, the United States. Uh, and, and, and really, Rushduni is, is the first big moment, uh, the, the first big movement, really, within Christian Reconstruction. And his yeah. institute continues to the present day. Yeah. Then there's, there's other groups that come out of that. There's another group in Tyler, Texas, uh, that was, that was um, heavily influenced by Gary North, by Gary North who was Rushduni's son-in-law. Um, Gary North continues to write voluminously to the present day. Um, he takes a slightly different view from his father-in-law on a number of issues, uh, and you know the the, the, um, the as as the two as as the movement began to bifurcate between Rushduni, let's say, and his son-in-law Gary North, uh, th th there came to be some quite sharply pronounced differences between those two groups, and then. To sort of cut to, 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 uh, towards the present day, there's been other little groups of, of uh, reconstructions that have sprung up. Um, they have moved from the Rashtuni generation through the um, through, 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 through the, the Gary North agenda to, to moderate, to tone down, um, to be much more practical or pragmatic uh, about some of the claims of, of reconstruction. But the, the, the current generation, uh, which ha are receiving these ideas, although they may sometimes hesitate to use the term or to self-identify as reconstructionist. They, while, for example, Doug Wilson, who I'm sure we'll talk about later on, uh, based in Moscow, Idaho, while he, for example, obviously and, and publicly appreciates Rushduni, he hesitates to call himself a reconstructionist, but I think is clearly influenced by that, by the agenda, by the aspiration, by, and I think crucially by this sense of bottom-up, gradualist, organic mm. transformation. Mm. So yeah. the movement's got a real history. It's, it's undoubtedly rubbing off its rougher edges. It's moving away from some of the extremely controversial views of Rushduni, although individuals like Doug Wilson are still um, espousing some extremely controversial views of their own. Um, but they're not Rushduni's controversial views. They are yes. their own controversial views. And... Um, and I think that 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 that's I think what we see as we 
as we can trace the kind of evolution of, of reconstruction theory and the social theory of Christian reconstruction is an ever increasing influence in broader society. And I think that influence is growing now. And this is really what the book's about. I, I, I'm arguing mm -hmm. that, that while lots of historians argue that reconstructionism is dead, I'm, I'm saying that if, if it used to be dead, it isn't anymore. Uh, yes. and in fact, it's, it's possibly um, coming into its most significant phase of influence. Mm. Yeah, th this, is, uh, this is something that I think I, I wanted to hear you talk about um, the most. Uh, so throughout the book, you make the constant refrain that in the States, Reconstructionism uh, as a movement has been so fragmented that people from the outside of the movement looking in go, oh, you know, who are these people? That's dead. Uh, Post-millennialism, a sort of utopian uh, Christian established uh, politic is so far outside of the scope of believability. Well, with Roe v. Wade and with Obergefell and with transgender rights and what we see is a sort of secular takeover in, of institutions and the marginalization of Christian ethic and principle. Uh, most conservative Christians are, are sort of pulling their hair out going, we're losing, we're losing. Uh, what your book does is say, actually uh christian reconstructionism is peaking precisely because it's coming out of this fragmented history so all of these people that have an emphasis on let's just say post-millennialism and it doesn't even have to be post-millennialism because pre-millennialism dispensationalists are, are are locking arms with the post-mill reconstructionist cats uh but nevertheless, conservative Christians are worried about the future of Christendom in America. Your book uh, says, guys, if we just look at the data, if we just look at the movements, if we look at where the popularization of this strain of thought is taking root and making impact into local communities, then you wouldn't actually say that. And that's a hard sell uh, for the people that watch the headlines all day, Christians that watch headlines all day, because they get it in their mind that Christianity is just done and uh, the American project is over with. And the American project was the, the, the shining city on the hill. We ran away from Europe to like establish the Christian nation. And it began well, but now it's all fallen apart because the libs have taken it all over. That's the dominant thought in my circles anyway, and I run in very conservative, reformed Christian circles. Uh, that phenomenon, though, uh, Dr. Gribben, is what I want to uh, ask you to sort of tease out a little bit for our audience. I want to, because I've been saying something similar to my friends, uh, my conservative, reformed Christian friends, is like, no, Christianity is not dead in America it's just taking on different pragmatic forms. So maybe you can talk to us about how the perceived decline of Christian reconstruct uh, reconstructionism as articulated by Rush Dooney, uh, sort of fragmented and in that, in that process of fragmentation has become stronger and more influential all the way up into you know, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. So Christian Reconstructionist thought is actually penetrating presidential candidates at this point and major, politi and major political figures. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's well, what I'm interested to hear about. You know, it's a really interesting topic that you raise there, um, Dale, because from this side of the Atlantic, we hear, we hear much more of the liberal media, liberal media in the United States than we ever do of the likes of Fox News or its cognates. And what we would hear in social media discourse or in our media's reflecting of American politics via CNN, MSNBC, or any of these other channels is actually the exact opposite of what you've described, uh, the kind of Fox News, conservative, reform, Christian 
view of the world. So, you know, what, what we hear over here is Texas passes a six week abortion bill. It, it's the end of Roe v. Wade. So, you know, I, I, I could I could probably list ex, um, example after example to counter the kind of pessimism of the Christian view, the, the conservative Christian view that, you, that you've just expressed. It seems to me as I as I sort of tune into American media discourse that actually you've got these two completely separate communities in America. One listens to that batch of, of news outlets, the other listens to that batch mm-hmm. of news outlets. But both batches of news outlets succeed in building audiences, precisely mm. by telling the people who listen to them that everything's about to fail and they need yes. to work harder to safeguard what's true about America. And they're, they're both pointing to completely rival conceptions of what America is actually all about and who best represents it. But they're both saying almost exactly the same thing on yeah. almost exactly the same issues. Yeah. It's uh, one of the things your book uh, highlights that I think is a real kind of irony of the the kind of eschatological optimism of, of, of this sort of stream of reform thought in America uh, is that it nevertheless, one of the reasons you can kind of link hands with the dispensationalists or Hal Lindsey on occasion uh, is that they don't fully get rid of the language of crisis. Uh, so what you, what you still have, even I think up to the present day in Reconstruction yeah. rhetoric, yeah. Uh, is a rhetoric about oh, we're about to fall off the cliff. There's the sort of there's the sort of apocalyptic thing is happening, and so the optimism is the optimism is almost uh, in some cases, and I think this is where the community probably differentiates a bit. But sometimes the optimism is almost deferred. You know, the expectation is we can get one or two small things done here, but the big stuff is going to come later. <laughs> you know, and so there's this fascinating juxtaposition of sort of of sort of long-term optimism, but short-term, you know, sort of, this is, you know, we, we could go down with the ship perhaps, uh, which I thought was best. But the, this, this is what fascinates me about Americans and American culture. Americans are deeply optimistic people when you meet them individually, but put them mm-hmm. into a group and everything's going wrong all of the time. <laughs> and, you know, uh, but, you know, the, I think that there is something about I mean, use the expression the American project. There's something about the American project that really resonates with expectations of doom. So, you know, as Dale said, the pilgrims head across to North America to establish a city on a hill. But the reason they do that is because they expect doom in England. You know, no sooner have they got there than things begin to collapse there, the halfway covenant, and they're trying to reify what it means to be a period of impunity. And you've got Smith Wigglesworth, and what's he writing about? The day of doom. You know, and you've got mm. all this sort of early modern New England preaching, and it's deeply influenced by doom. Jonathan Edwards' most famous sermon, a spider hanging over hell. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you can take example after example, and you get doom, 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 doom. What, what I think is really interesting, though, is that by the time you come to the 20th century, late, late 19th, early 20th century, um, in, in mainstream culture, in fin de siècle uh, culture, you've got uh, the, 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 the beginnings of what becomes modernism. And modernism is a cultural moment that's based upon the idea of crisis. And of course, you've got the First World War, you've got all of, you know, you've got the Great Depression, mm-hmm. uh, you've got the hyperinflation of the 1920s, uh, the, 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 the catastrophe of European totalitarianism in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. And, and that is the culture in which this idea of crisis begins to emerge. And we have never got out, I think, of the shadow of that sense of crisis. We cannot stop thinking about crisis. It's oil crisis in the 70s. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's Cuban Missile Crisis in the 1960s, oil in the 1970s, 1980s mm. is the beginning of environmentalism, you know, and on and on. You've just got this idea of, of crisis that grips until eventually, yeah. it seems to me, it begins to control the way that Americans especially think about themselves, their communities, their nation, and its possible future. And I think what's so remarkable about that is you've got crisis shaping post-millennialism, as Rushduni begins to articulate. Yes. So yes. instead of looking, you know, instead of being a, a kind of a 17th century or even a 19th century post-millennialist, where it's just the gradual movement towards inevitable victory. Right. Rushduni has this um, this idea of, of immediate short-term cultural catastrophe. Mm. And of course, you know, his son-in-law, Guy North, 
it really runs with that in the late 1990s and the run up to Y2K. Yeah. Y2K. One, yes. of, one of the things that your book on, on, does that's, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, I, oh, one of the things your book does that's uh, uh, very, very good, I thought, uh, is capturing, and, and I think it's the, the element you just mentioned, sort of this politics of crisis that is a, a very American motif. Uh, but you also uh, 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 bring in another very American motif, which is the, fr the, the frontier narrative. Yes. Uh, yeah. that, that what you do in the crisis is move away from it. Uh, and, and the West Coast, the Pacific Northwest, and this is what makes this region so fascinating. It, it is in some ways one of the very uh, last sort of cultural, it has the feel of a kind of open frontier, both aesthetically, but also uh, you connect this in a, in a lot of ways. But, you know, I think of uh, this was the this was the area that er Ernst Kallenbach wrote this book in the 60s, I think, called Ecotopia. And it was about the Pacific Northwest seceding from the Union and developing its own little, hip, you know, free anarchist hippie commune. Ralph Nader loved the book quite a bit. But the point is, is like there's an there's an ethos in that very area of the world, whether it be hippies going to Humboldt County to grow their weed farms or it be spiritual entrepreneurs coming from the East Coast uh, or Mark Driscoll even uh, is this kind of uh, it's, it's a fascinating area for kind of. Uh, very independent uh, sort of uh, move, movements around independent personalities and and projects and yet for that reason what's what's fascinating to me is uh maybe for that reason it's also one of the least repeatable projects uh maybe you know this is the time will tell mm. this but but it's the, the in, in, in the one sense the moscow community is is clearly a an intergenerational successful project there's a lot to say about what's been accomplished it's a real accomplishment and yet it's been an accomplishment uh, it seems that has been partly uh, accomplished uh, part of what it has accomplished is by means of kind of a lot of migration uh, whereas in a lot of county you know if one were to take the sort of county by county strategy into you know a suburban america you know dallas for instance you wouldn't be able to count on that kind of migratory pattern i think and so there's a it's interesting that it's both the most successful, but also not necessarily sort of endlessly repeatable. Uh, yeah. And so you're, I thought your book captured some some very interesting dynamics that were very helpful on that, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, Joe. I mean, I suppose there's, there's an obvious comparison between the Doug Wilson Moscow community and Tim Keller's Manhattan community. You yeah. Know, in, in many respects, they're both looking at cultural transformation, but one of them is attempting that in a mega city where, it, where you know, they, they may attract prominent journalists or artists or, or musicians, but they will never have the kind of momentum to shape the culture of downtown New York City. Whereas Moscow, Idaho, a community of 20,000 people, once you start inviting people to move into that, it, you know, every person represents a huge percentage yes. of the total population. So you, know, you, you can move much quicker towards some kind of tipping point in, yeah. for example, Moscow, Idaho, than you'll ever do in, 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 in yes. Manhattan. Like the Ramanesians in Oregon was the most extreme example of this. You exactly, know. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dr. Griffin, I want to talk a, a little bit about kinism. Uh, you bring it up in the book. It's sort of peppered throughout, uh, I think, almost every chapter, actually, uh, unless I'm not uh, remembering correctly. But uh, kinism is linked with reconstructionism in some way. So in your field work, 2015, 2016, you're going around, you're looking at these communities that are trying to live out the project of reconstructing uh, and surviving the inevitable collapse of Western civilization due to the influences of modernity, whether that be technological or philosophical or theological liberalism or whatever. Um, and there's no coherent uh, community amongst the actors in the reconstructionist movement, but you've located a pattern uh, of um, sort of commitments in one way or another, whether it be a sort of thick commitment or a thin commitment, um, to something adjacent or just fully embodying kinism. Uh, I'm interested in that for more reasons than this, but primarily because racism in America is, makes the headlines almost every day, both on Fox News and CNN. Uh, 
So um, maybe it would be good to first tell us about what kinism is theologically, philosophically, in a con uh, concise way as you possibly can. And then why is reconstructionism sort of like open to bits of the particles of kinism in some strains of, of reconstructionism, and then just fully embracing all of the implication of kinism in other uh, sort of movements of, of reconstructionism? Well, that's a really interesting question. Uh, kinism is the, is, is a, is a, I'm not sure if it's a movement exactly, um, but it, kinists, let, let, let's not make it an ism. Uh, kinists are people who believe that they will be happiest living with people of their own kin. So obviously kin, the, the word itself echoes in the old south. So it has that kind of mentality, I think, coming through. But I mean, I think basically what these people are saying is we, we want to live in, in essentially monocultural communities where people look like us, you know, like the same food, the same music, um, you know, where, where, where where people are pretty much the same. Now, the, the kinists I met said they were not racists. They said they were racialists. Now, that's a, maybe a nice distinction, but the distinction I think that they were reaching for was that they believed in racial segregation rather than racial supremacy. So if you ask them, are you a white supremacist? They would say no, um, they be, but they did believe that races should be... Um, living segre segregated lives uh, that, 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 that um, you know, um, diff different kind of cultural racial groups should have their own place and should organize themselves as they wish and should, um, you know, seek their fulfillment in Jesus Christ in, in that separate racial space. Um, they, the the kinists that we met in North Idaho were very interesting people, very interesting people very secretive, very worried about publicity, um, very happy to talk, and also very concerned about what would happen as a consequence of that speech. Yeah. And it, it was, I mean, it, it was fascinating talking to them because of, of all of the people we met, they were the most up to date with Frankfurt School theory. Um, you know, the, the, the way they presented themselves, they, they weren't hicks from the sticks. They were very hip. They were very cool. I mean, they were cool people. No, no, no yeah. uh, they, you know, they, 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 they met for worship in a forest. Hmm. Um, they had some kind of pastoral oversight uh, in normal reform style because that there were clergy coming to do baptisms, to minister in the Lord's Supper. I, you know, we didn't find out who those clergy were. It probably wouldn't have been appropriate to ask. But, but for all that, they might seem to be isolated families. There was a sense that we were beginning to see the, the, the kind of hesitant emergence of an actual network. But we only saw it and it kind of faded from view. So it, it was quite difficult to track. Um, but those kinists, they, they were in North Idaho, they loved Doug Wilson's ministry. They just wished he'd be a bit more consistent. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and they thought that would mean he would become a kinist. They loved Rush Dooney. They really loved Rush Dooney. And they were very happy to point to those passages in Rush Dooney's work where he does make some you know, pretty unfortunate comments about, about race and, and racial difference. Um, the theologian they probably loved most was Robert Louis Dabney. For, for, yeah. for those reasons. Yeah. And and you know, when they're when they're talking about education, um, you know, e even talking about relocation, uh, talking about the failure of a culture, the collapse of a culture. I mean, it just it, it just the, the conversation resonated with all the things that you read in Dabney about the end of the Civil War, how to rescue the old South, and um, the way in which Southern culture would be preserved not by people but by churches. You know, it, it was it was really um, a kind of a revivification of, of, of a lot of Dabney's ideas. So, they, I mean, they definitely saw themselves as Reconstructionists. Uh, and, you know, they, 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 they really saw themselves as Rushduni's heirs. And, um, you know, um, I think we're, we're very, very explicit about that. Mm. Mm. So, I, I mean, I suppose to, to go to your question, though, Dale, 
the, sure. the, there is a relationship between kinism and reconstruction. I'm not sure if it's a cause and consequence kind of relationship. I wonder if it's more a kind of correlation. I'm just not sure. But certainly true that the kinists we met were reconstructionists. And yeah. I suspect there's other groups out there with similar kinds of views on race and Christian community and Christian flourishing happening best in racially distinguished communities who probably wouldn't distinguish themselves or, or identify themselves as reconstructionist and um, may, may in fact be pointing to um, material like um, Dake, the, the, the Dake Study Bible um, written by that um, Pentecostal right. holiness preacher. Uh, yeah. Right. And I don't want to and I, I'm, I don't want to pigeonhole the because as your book details, which this is why I appreciated the book, you're a good historian. You get very little Dr. Gribben through the book. What you just get is sort of <laughs> there are jokes still if you pay attention. I do. Oh, like I, oh I see the jokes. The jokes I see the jokes. <laughs> yes. It's yes. beautiful. Yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> yes. But you get very little of you. Uh, you get uh, just your findings uh, presented in a very articulate way. It's a fun book to read, yeah. which is something to say about history books. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and I don't want to pigeonhole anybody who sort of holds the label of a reconstructionist as you're adjacent to kinism in some way and kinism equals something racist and bad and therefore go away because you're a racist. That's not that's not what you do in the book. And that's not what I want to try to that's not what I want to imply. What I do find fascinating is that majority of the people, and this is anecdotal, that I've met in my social circles, both personally and on in social media, when I do encounter this sort of segregated, like we need to make sure we're breeding our people because our people are mixing with other people and they're going to die off in 150 years. We won't even be able to notice our lineage in 150 years if we keep interbreeding uh, and they normally go back to like the tower of babel and they make this big biblical theological argument i'm not meaning to link the two movements together but i do find it interesting that most of the kinists that i've experienced in my life do hold to some principle some foundational um principles of reconstructionism so that's why i was curious about that yeah uh so do you think that, uh, and then Joe, I'll let you get in there. Yeah, right. uh, uh, do you think that um, moving forward with the people that you have interviewed, uh, that you've talked with in your field work, that because you do make a distinction between those that want to be sort of political activists, those that want to like change laws, and those that just want to hunker down and sort of be self-sufficient and wait for the collapse and then create uh, small communities of trust and interdependence on one another. Do you see that kinism uh, is more prevalent in the politically activist mind of the reconstructionist movement, or is it on the other side of the sort of agrarian revolution back to the roots sort of thinking? Yeah, a fascinating question, Gail. And I suppose the honest answer is that our sample is probably too small to make any bigger claim about kinism or kinists yeah. Yeah. in general. But the, the ones that we spoke to were essentially hiding. And um, I suppose like lots of people in Idaho, they had migrated from California. They had left big tech jobs in California. Mm. They had moved out uh, to, to the... I suppose the inland Northwest rather than the Pacific Northwest, but they, they, they moved into North Idaho um, really to escape um, modernity and to, to, to get away from a certain kind of lifestyle, um, which was trapping them into um, a certain way of, of working to meet certain kinds of mortgage payments, to keep up a kind of impossible, yeah. a, an impossible attempt to achieve the American dream in the West Coast. They, they had given that up to have a much simpler much more rural, much quieter, uh, and much more handcrafty kind of, 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 of life, much more yeah. um, sustainable life, actually, uh, in, yeah. in, in Idaho. So my, my sense of it was that these, these were people 
Now, bear in mind, this is 2016 when I last had right. interaction with him. And a lot has happened in American race politics since 2016. Yes. So that's an important caveat. But, um, you know, but back, but back in 2016, they, 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 they were very nervous. They were nervous about publicity. They wanted it, but they were nervous about it. Um, except that the, a number of the ones that we spoke to, a number of the kinists we spoke to, also had very active online social lives uh, with, you know, um, handles and avatars um, that, that, that were kind of easy to see through after a while and actually put up a huge amount of very personal information on websites like faithandheritage.com and um, even in, on, you know, on, on, on other sites as well. Um, including social media. So there, there was both this odd attempt at seclusion, mm. but also a sense that the only way in which they could connect or the best way in which they could connect with others was through the internet. But that required some degree of publicity or, or opening up yeah. their, their private yeah. experience. Uh, and they were sort of caught, caught on that rock that, that the internet could both facilitate relationships and also expose them. Hmm. And um, you know, I suppose like a lot of people, they were, they were trying to balance what, what privacy really what privacy Right. Really One of the, you, you mentioned, because uh, uh, this is really, uh, I think, uh, another theme sort of in this, and, and as we are uh, we're, we're, we're sort of winding down to a close here, but maybe one thing to talk about is sort of futural. Uh, one thing historians, of course, can't do is predict the future, but uh, if you can get it as good as the weatherman, then we're, then we'll uh, then we'll you know then uh, then you know, you you've earned your salary. I was gonna say. Uh, uh, one of the things that's interesting about uh, the groups we're talking about is that you you see a this motif of sort of escaping modernity that perhaps unites some of the families that come together, uh, and yet the 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 very fact of migration, uh, uh, you, you know, an era of an era of of you know everybody being transistory. Uh, the deployment of media, and I wonder uh, the relationship to an intellectual project uh, mm -hmm. uh, strike me in some way all as somewhat modern, which is not a pejorative thing in my in my judgment uh, to, to say something is modern. And yet there's a tension between sort of the rejection of modernity and on the other hand, sort of a deep sublimination of it in this in this other way. Uh, uh, and I wonder if, yeah, I wonder if that that tension is, strikes you as fair, given your, you know, what you've said. And then maybe what we'll go on to discuss is what's the future of all of this? Maybe not Reconstructionism, but that the impact of it on, on American life. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's a fair comment, Joe. I think that this this is an anti, a modern a modernist anti modernist movement uh, in, in in a sense. But I mean, I suppose to, to be fair, to be fair to the folk involved in this, that's that probably shouldn't really surprise us because evangelicalism has always built in the 20th century has always been an anti-modernist modernist movement mm -hmm. it's always depended upon the tools of the trade of modernism uh, whether it's mass communication or you know or whatever it may be uh, even the rise of the celebrity you know it's always depended upon these ideas to advance its own agenda and i suppose these folk for all that they might be critical of the evangelicalism um, if we're happy to use that term even. But for all that they may be critical of evangelicalism, I think that they're very much the, the, the heirs of, you know, the great mid-20th century evangelical agendas, which are, you know, to protect the family, um, to, you know, to, to, to create cultures that are resilient in the face of massive social change um, and so on. But your, your next point, Joe, was going to be about the future of these movements, wasn't it? Yeah, it's just, what, where do you, you know, you know, we're, in one sense, we're looking at a th sort of three boxes of sort of the development of dominionism, and, and you also, sorry, I should say reconstructionism, but uh, but you also talk about at the very moment that we've sort of uh, abandoned, uh, 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 one side has abandoned reconstructionism and sort of popular politics, it's quite popular in popular politics. And so maybe, you know, when, you, when you're looking, you know, it's been uh, you, you did a lot. A lot of this field work was done in uh, 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 2016. You said, "What a, uh, what do you see when you're looking at it now? It's 2021. Uh, presumably, these are still of, of interest to you to follow. Uh, 
what do you see as perhaps uh, kind of the emerging next steps for this movement, I suppose? Uh, well, that, yeah, that, that's a fascinating question. Back in 2015, 2016, um, none of these people were Trumpian. None of them were Trump supporters. Um, I didn't meet a single Trump supporter when I was there. Now, mm. fast forward to 2020 election, um, I think Doug Wilson had, had sort of come to terms with the, the political options available to him and had, I think, begun to swing quite considerably behind Trump. The funny thing was that Trump had begun to swing around him, uh, Doug Wilson as well, because there was that mm. famous incident during the, um, the, the non-illegal anti-COVID Sam Singh. Uh, I got into yeah. trouble for saying it was illegal. It was thought to be illegal at the time, but then the city had to back down and say it wasn't illegal and everyone got released and, and so on. So the non-illegal Sam Singh, famously September um, 2020, uh, when the police turned up outside Moscow City Hall and began hauling off members of Christchurch congregation, um, great publicity, of course, um, you know, a genius move uh, in terms of, <laughs> of, of, of what is, there's no doubt. Um, yes. and, and of course, it was Trump who seized upon that moment to say, um, this is what the Dems are going to do to your churches. So conservative evangelicals, you vote for me. I mean, that that would have been completely unpredictable back when we were doing field work. Yeah. That would have been impossible to conceive. That that community that, that did not take Trump at all seriously would have to come to terms with the fact of his election and then and then have to come to terms with the great um, surge of opposition to Trumpism um, in the face of the extraordinarily weak democratic response that resulted in Joseph Biden being the um, utterly um, unimpressive presidential candidate. Uh, and, and, and as time has gone on, of course, I mean, it was very interesting there on the anniversary of 9-11 to see Trump uh, um, with the firemen in New York City and then at the boxing match at night and, and the crowd chanting four more years. I mean, this, we are, one of the, I think one of the challenges of writing about this movement and thinking about this movement is that we are talking about reconstructionism, which is a movement itself that is evolving through time in a context of liberal democracy, which in the United States is moving into a moment of profound crisis. There's that word again, but a genuine movement of profound crisis where distrust in the political process is incredibly high, where candidates on both sides are now calling attention to weaknesses, perhaps even exaggerating weaknesses in the systems that make American democracy possible. And in the back of that very systemic analysis of American politics, you've also got people like Patrick Deneen, uh, the Notre Dame uh, political mm -hmm. scientist, writing books about why liberalism failed. And that's provoked a, 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 a response on the part of conservative Catholics and others who are deeply worried that um, the, the American constitutional tradition, uh, the Lockean principles that underlie that, are, are, have themselves capitulated to a vision of the world that is deeply anti-biblical, anti-truthful, and ultimately um, denying personhood. So, right. you know, you've got Reconstructionism changing over time, always to become more winsome, always to become more persuasive, always to get greater publicity. You've also got the American political culture collapsing in upon itself. And you've got eminent political scientists, I mentioned Patrick Neen, but there's others as well, writing about the reality of, um, or writing about the, uh, the, the, the their fears that um, the philosophy that underlies the American democratic system is bankrupt. Mm. And then you've got people like Rod Dreher, writing books about the Benedict Option and other books like that, uh, calling people to, to move geographically, calling upon people to embrace community values, to become crunchy conservatives and all of this kind of rhetoric. And it's yeah. all the same thing. This is a moment of extraordinary opportunity for any religious community that can speak with conviction, cogency, clarity to the present situation. If they can say that, they have in some senses anticipated it, which any follower of Rashtuni can do, because Rashtuni in the 60s did anticipate this moment. Yeah. And he wrote about it decades ahead of its 
uh, being achieved in reality. And yeah. anyone who points to that and draws on that the, and, and draws that down, I think, is in a potentially extremely successful position. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's it's so interesting you say that because here's what I see, brother. I see a lot of my friends um, looking around at the political landscape of America. You mentioned in your book, George Orwell's 1984 sold millions and millions and millions and millions of copies recently. Novels like all the dystopian future novels, Brave New World, 1984, Animal Farm, Lewis's Trilogy, all of these things are bec becoming popular again. And people are sort of grabbing a hold of those and integrating them into whatever movement they find themselves in. We even have liberals uh, on the far extreme left that are quoting George Orwell. Uh, so everybody's co-opting these narratives to apply to their particular political motivations to further whatever agenda they have going on. And one of the things that was interesting about um, the comments that you make throughout the book, each one of your sections, and it's a very well organized book, by the way, it, it goes through uh, migration and government and eschatology and education. Uh, so you really do cover the big categories that the the uh, um, reconstructionist movement sort of uh, they articulate in their own different ways. But what's interesting is that there's this whole flavor of reconstructionists that don't believe in political activism. They really do seclude themselves. And so just to be fully transparent, I used to be a uh, full anarchist libertarian. That's how I grew up. Uh, dad was part of Ron Paul's campaign up in New Jersey when I was a little boy. I grew up hearing about the evils of big government and yada, yada, yada. And then when I was saved, um, I started to get arguments for reformed Christianity. And then I tried to integrate my political sort of impulses into my Christianity. And eventually God just wins, right? And so you got to like throw that away. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I do find it interesting that uh, the people that are that are in the recon the leaders of the reconstructionist movements, whatever that means, geographically with their different twists and turns on Rush Dooney, uh, you have an emphasis on patriarchy and order and the rule of law, but then you have anarchy. Like you've got a, you've got a, a strain of anarchy where it's like Big Brother is watching us and read George Orwell and Animal Farm and 1984 and Brave New World and that hideous strength and fight, fight the system. So you, you really do have this sort of contradictory it's almost it, neo-anabaptist, isn't it? Because you have like that character mm -hmm. you mentioned who, uh, well, the government shouldn't take care of that. The elders of the church should, you know, should step in when there's problems. And you start thinking like, ah, I think I know how that, you know, that's a, that yeah. sounds just like a. That's always a happy ending. Always a happy ending. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I'm just sort of throwing that out there as a statement. Uh, there's a bunch of questions I could ask off of that, but I, but I, I, I want to say I appreciate the fact that we have documented in your book. I always take the dust jacket off because, uh, you know, I just let it, comes, go. it comes cheaper that way, deal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate the the fact that you're pointing to this phenomenon. Uh, and there really is a paradoxical mindset that one has to embrace which I think most conservatives would apply to their uh, more progressive interlocutors. Uh, so the conservatives are pointing over to the liberals and saying, you're nonsensical and you hold contradictory things or you're not being consistent in your thought. Well, it may be true of your people as well. And so there's that self-reflective moment, I think, that we all need to sort of grapple with in modernity where we say, where am I actually not being, if I want patriarchy and I want to appeal to submission, 
but then I take Romans 13 and I flip it on its head and I only use it to the ends for which I want to use it for, then you're embodying the same spirit of the age that you're criticizing your liberal interlocutors with. Yeah. Uh, so that's just something we need to, I think, say. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not asking for your opinion on that because you're just doing history. Maybe, maybe, maybe before Dale before Dale closes us out, a, 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 yeah. a sincerely last question would be: uh, Yes, your what what where does this book come from for you? So you know you uh, we can we can see here that you write about Puritanism and uh, a God's Irishman, obviously theological debates in Cromwell in <laughs> Ireland. I mean that that one, uh, but uh, you know. Uh, uh, judging from uh, externals, uh, you weren't born in Texas, uh, and, so, and yet you're writing about this fairly idiosyncratic American movement. Uh, what, what, what? Be how did that become an attractive topic for you? Well, I mean, the the short answer is um, I stumbled into a pile of these magazines, Credenda Agenda, back in the '90s, and got curious about it. I was writing my PhD at the time on Puritan eschatology, and here was a latter-day group, apparently of Puritans, certainly people who are interested in Puritans, adopting that es eschatology and trying to work out how a social mm. theory would develop. So, I mean, that's that's kind of short answer. The longer answer is, and this has maybe only become clear to me more recently, is that perhaps subconsciously, I've been thinking a lot about endings. So I've just, I've just done a book, a book mm. came out there last week called The Rise and Fall of Christian Ireland which is a book that's very close to my heart um, as, as, a, as an account of how Christianity arrived in Ireland, what it did in Ireland, how it shaped the Irish, uh, and then how in a period of less than 30 years, it has virtually disappeared. Hmm. And I suppose, I mean, I, I, when I came back from Moscow, I, it took me a while to realise, but eventually I did realise, that what the people in Moscow were trying to do was build a town like the town I live in. Except they're at the start of that process. And I live at the end of that process. Hmm. So the, the town I live in, Balamina in County Antrim, is a town that's been deeply influenced by evangelical religion. It probably has the biggest concentration of evangelicals anywhere in the world. Um, strongly Presbyterian area. Um, they, they, there was a massive revival in 1859 that people still talk about. You know, it's, it's part of the, the mythology of this period, of, of this area. And, and, you know, undoubtedly, that really, I mean, really, really, really conservative evangelical religion um, expressed in Baptist, Presbyterian, Plymouth Brethren congregations has really shaped the, the, the social and cultural and even economic life of our town. Hmm. And Moscow's at the start of that process. You know, I think... The, the, the people the people who are there are trying, I mean, they say explicitly they want to make Moscow a Christian town. Our town, by any estimation, is probably the most Christian town in Europe. Mm -hmm. Certainly, but let, let, let me rephrase that, the most evangelical town in Europe. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, But here we are at the very end of that process, and it's changing very rapidly. And I'm an historian. I'm also a Christian. Um, I value things about Christian culture. I see there are strengths in that that are being lost as my town, this area, my my country moves away from that. And I suppose I've I've been I've been thinking about that and, and, and seeing the two projects actually interlocking. And then a third thing, my, my actual day job uh, at work is to write about early modern religion, so 17th century Puritanism. And my most recent work there on John Owen, uh, the, the the famous 17th century Puritan writer, has been to look at, not his ideas, which are, everyone knows now, mm -hmm. uh, but actually to look at the people who went to his little congregation of 30 odd people in the 1660s and how did they cope with defeat? Mm. And it has been, I mean, I think, I think it slowly dawned on me that in each of these areas, contemporary America and um, contemporary Ireland and 17th century England, I've been tracing the same thing. I've been trying to look for answers to the same question. Mm. What should Christians do when they feel that what they've been attempting to achieve in terms of building a congregation, 
um, creating the conditions for Christian culture, when they suddenly realise that's not going to work anymore, what do they do next? Yeah, that's that's really, I think, yeah. what I've been thinking about. And th th this book started me off in that um, the rise and fall of Christian Ireland. Did I mention it just came out last week? Um, yes. <laughs> Christian Ireland was, 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 yeah. was yes. a way of continuing that that thought, and then the sort of experiments in John Owen. I think mm. are just a, a way of kind of tracing that uh, 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 um, again. Yeah, beautiful. And and uh, Joe, we should get a copy of the book. And then yeah. have our brother back on for another yeah, discussion. That's, yeah, that sounds fantastic. Yes. All right. Well, Dr. Gribben, we appreciate your work, brother. I think it's yes, important. Thank you. Um, it's very clarifying. Uh, and it's just a good piece of historical um, yep. scholar scholarship. So um, I recommend everyone run out and get the book. If you're interested in what's going on in the Pacific Northwest and sort of uh, meta movements with Reconstructionism in North America, uh, Dr. Gribben has given us at least a beginning move to think about how we should understand this. And I'm interested as well, brother, to continue Christian culture in America as long as we're doing it in a way that honors Christ uh, and yeah. makes our light shine. Uh, I believe we can have a city on the hill, uh, a shining city on the hill, but only through pious movements so thank you very much brother we appreciate your time we appreciate the book and uh lord willing we'll we'll talk in the future so great, great. Uh, yes. as always guys head over to our facebook uh group the pilgrim faith podcast you can join the conversation just tag joe in everything that you say in the group <laughs> so that way he has to deal with the notifications yeah. uh, we've got a facebook page you can check out the davenin institute's uh, youtube channel where you can find all of our previous episodes we're also on itunes and all of the podcasts that you can get on all of the podcast catchers uh so joe i love you brother love you too man dr griven thank you so much yes you don't love me oh i do <laughs> love you we love you very much. <laughs> oh, that's, yes. you, you say that at the end of every podcast, and you're the only one that's ever been offended. So, uh, yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that. That's beautiful. So, uh, this was the best exclusive relationship. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dr. Griffin, I love you, brother. I love you too, brother. Yeah. <laughs> too much. Yeah. <laughs> Until next time, take care, y'all. We will All right. see you see soon. Ya. All right.